Welcome back, folks, and welcome to our online students. Today, what we're going to do is introduce something called intermolecular forces. And intermolecular forces are these attractions that happen between molecules. And I myself get a little bit confused between intermolecular forces and intramolecular forces. And so they are two different things. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw out a couple of molecules here. And in this case, I'm going to draw water molecules. And if you're a chemistry person and you've taken chemistry, there's like two things you got to be able to leave chemistry being able to do. You got to know Avogadro's number and you got to be able to draw a water molecule. If you can't do, do those two things, they should just like fail you. Like as you're taking the final exam and you're walking out the door, they should be like, what's Avogadro's number? And you go 6.022 times 10 to the 20. Awesome. Okay. And then say, okay, draw me a water molecule. And if you can't do that, man, they should just like take your ID and rip it up right, right there. Okay. So here's a water molecule. Uh, we're going to go water molecule looks like this. Okay. And then I'm going to draw another one here that looks like this. Okay. Here's our water molecules. And we learned that our water molecules have very electronegative elements here, oxygen and a couple of lone pairs on that oxygen. A couple of lone pairs on that oxygen. And you might remember that there's a steric number of four and that this is a tetrahedral arrangement, right? All these things. Now, what happens here is we have this, this electronegative element and that electronegative element here pulls electrons towards itself. And so that makes this a little electropositive and where those electrons left becomes electro Positive. I said positive, didn't I? But I meant negative. I'm glad you were paying attention there. That was a trick. I was trying to see if you were paying attention. You were paying attention. You saw that. Okay. So electronegative on the oxygen, electropositive here on the hydrogen. And the same thing happens here. So we have electronegative on the oxygen, electropositive here on the hydrogen. And there's an attraction here between positive and negative. That positive and negative, there's an attraction like this here, like that. Okay. So that attraction between these two different molecules, we call this a intermolecular force. So intermolecular force. Intermolecular force. That's between two different molecules. That's different than intramolecular force. So here I have a hydrogen that is attracted to an oxygen, there's a covalent bond there. That bond there is an intra. Intramolecular force. And that force of attraction is stronger. This is a very strong attraction that keeps that hydrogen attached to that oxygen. So if you were to grab these two molecules, if you had like tiny little tweezers and you were to try to pull them apart, where they would break apart would be here, this, intra, this intermolecular force. That's what would pull them apart. Now I get these two words confused, intra and inter, confused. Um, and somebody told me that there's this, this roadway system that goes between states this highway system, okay? And this highway system that goes between, between states is called the interstate, interstate highways. If you take Interstate 35, which runs through Duluth, it has one stoplight between here and Mexico. There's only one stoplight on Highway 35, Interstate 35. Where's that stoplight? It's in Duluth, yes, because Duluth is the end of the world, yes. That is the only stoplight on Interstate 35. Now, intrastate would be just highways within the state. Okay, so that, that somebody told me that's how you can remember the, those different words, intermolecular and intramolecular forces. Now, these forces, there's things that affect these forces that make them stronger and weaker. And so forces that affect this are factors that affect this are the size of molecules, so size of molecules, size of molecules is going to affect this. And the bigger the size, the bigger the force. So I'm just going to say here, um, big molar mass equals 
big inner molecular force. Okay, so the bigger the molar mass, the bigger the force. And I'll explain why that is here in, in just a second. And then um, the other thing is the shape. So shape, the shape affects intermolecular forces. And the, the, this has to do with surface area. So for example, if we have two atoms and we draw them as spheres, like this, here's one atom, here's another atom, where they are touching these two different atoms, the, there, there's very little surface area. So there's not a whole lot of attraction. If we imagine these are two atoms and they're covered in glue, where they touch is their intermolecular force. And there's very little surface area touching. So that's not going to be a very strong attraction. However, if we have long molecules that look like this, there's a long molecule, there's another long molecule there. Okay, so these two molecules, if we imagine them covered in glue, so if we imagine these two molecules covered in glue, there's a lot of surface area there that, that they can come in contact with each other. And so this would have a lot of intermolecular force. There'd be a lot of stickiness happening there. So the shape also plays a role in our intermolecular forces. Now, here's a table, a couple of tables from a chemistry textbook. And there's something here. I, I don't want to memorize this, so I'm, I'm looking for, for trends. So as you're looking at these, if you can see a trend, raise your hand. Once, when you see a trend in there, raise your hand. Okay, keep your hands up. We'll just wait here. We're going to see if we can get a few more people here to get their hands up. Okay, we start seeing something there. Okay, something's starting to stick. We're going, ah, I see what's going on there. Okay, I see what's going on. All right, good. So help me out here. What did you notice? What, what kind of an association did you see here? The larger the size, the higher the boiling point. Excellent. It's a great observation. That's what I was hoping we would see. So what's the deal here? In order for something to boil, we have to get those molecules and pull them apart from each other. So that way they go from a liquid into a gas. Now the stronger the intermolecular force, the stronger they are attracted to each other, the harder it will be to boil it. You'll have to add more energy to pull them apart. So as you can see here, the larger these molecules are, the higher the boiling point, the higher the intermolecular forces. Okay, now the question is why? So here on the right-hand side here, these molecules, these diatomic molecules, you can imagine that they have more surface area than a single sphere. So if they're covered in glue and you stick two of them together, there's more that can come in contact with each other. These ones here are just spheres. But the larger the sphere gets, the larger the sphere gets, the more um, contact that we can have. The other thing that happens is that if we have a larger sphere, for example, and I'm just going to say, um, here's radon, R, N. Okay, radon is a big atom here. It's got lots of electrons. If we have lots of electrons here, this big cloud of electrons, just out of random chance, it's possible that those electrons could end up unevenly distributed where more of them are on one side than another. And if that happens, then this side over here becomes electronegative. This side over here where we don't have as many electrons would become electropositive. Okay? That becomes easier the larger a molecule is. So the larger a molecule becomes, the easier we can have this, we call this a temporary dipole, um, where we have the electrons temporarily over at one side. So the bigger the molecule is, the easier that is. All right. Now another example of this is looking at different hydrocarbons. Here we've got a graph where on the lower side here, the lower axis, we've got molar mass, and on the vertical axis we have the boiling point. And you can see that as these molecules get larger in their molar mass, they have a higher boiling point. In other words, they're more sticky. And if you were to go to the Husky refinery over in Superior, Wisconsin, they're taking crude oil which is a mixture of all of these different hydrocarbons, and they are separating them out. And the lower molecular mass ones, that's methane, that's natural gas, that's the smallest one there, that's a gas at room temperature. And as we move our way up to the upper right, we get to octane. Octane is what they put in gasoline, and that's a liquid at room temperature. 
And then if you go even further beyond that, you get into even larger molecules, and that's where Vaseline comes from. Vaseline is a petroleum product, and those are the really huge, massive, chunky molecules. And those are kind of a solid, pasty sort of thing at room temperatures and pressures. Now, the shape, like I said, is also important in, in these intermolecular forces. Here we have three molecules that have roughly the same molar mass. On the left is pentane, and it has the highest boiling point. And that's because that pentane that has a kind of a linear or a flat-ish uh, molecule has lots of surface area to come in contact. And so if you imagine these molecules covered in glue, pentane is going to be a little stickier than over here. We have this 2,2-dimethylpropane. And so there's less surface area to come in contact and is going to be less sticky, less sticky. Now, this all leads to another property besides boiling point, melting point, viscosity. Now, viscosity is one of those big $5 words that just means how resistant is something to flow. And the way that you measure this is it's really, really, like, basic. And that is you take a bucket, you poke a hole in it, and then you just see how long it takes the stuff to ooze out. Kid you not. That's how they measure viscosity. It's not real fancy. And so here is a fanciest looking device here, this little bucket there, and you're just dripping this stuff out. Now, one of the oldest experiments in the world, and I think this was done in the United Kingdom, is somebody took this really thick hydrocarbon, like creosote type stuff, put it in a bucket, poked a hole in it, and then set it, and they're trying to measure its viscosity. And this experiment has been going on now, I believe, for over 200 years. And, like, they, they just keep checking up on it to see, oh, okay, is it dripped out yet? No, we're still waiting, right? Now, somebody's, their thesis depends on this, right? You know, so I don't know what's going to happen to them. But, yeah, that's one of the oldest experiments. Now, here's um, some other hydrocarbons, and this is not something to memorize here, but we can see that as the molar mass gets larger, the viscosity gets larger. And so these molecules at the bottom, they have more surface area to come in contact. They become stickier, and that increases then, increases the viscosity. All right, so now trying to put all this together, I'm thinking like a little cheat sheet, like a little diagram here. We're going to make a little diagram that's going to help us to see some things here and see how this all comes together. So we're going to make a little table, and we're going to say here atom. This is like our intermolecular forces cheat sheet. Atom, molecule, atom, molecule. And then we're going to go boiling point, melting point, and then we'll do viscosity. Viscosity. And we'll start out here with some big juicy atoms like this. There's a nice big juicy atom, medium sized atom, and a little tiny atom. And then molecules will do the same thing. Be nice big juicy atoms like that. Okay, and then medium sized ones, and then little ones like there, little happy atoms, as Bob Ross would say. All right, now we're going to take a look here at boiling point, melting point, and viscosity. We've got big atoms here. Big atoms, little atoms. Big atoms, big atoms. More sticky, less sticky. More sticky, lots of surface area. More sticky, high or low boiling point. High, high or low melting point. High. Big sticky atoms, viscosity, high or low. And then if we go down here for our small, our small atoms and molecules, that'll be a small boiling point, and then a small melting point, and a small viscosity. Okay. So based off of this, really, bigger is bigger, smaller is smaller. Does that work? I'm not a big fan of memorizing things, but if I can remember that. Okay, bigger is bigger, smaller is smaller. Now, we have different types of intermolecular forces. So, intermolecular force types. So, inner, um, inter, let me say here, inter, 
molecular forces. There's different types of intermolecular forces, and we have some strong ones, and we have some weak ones. Okay, so weak ones and strong ones. So we're going up like this here to say that these are going to be our stronger intermolecular forces, and down here would be our weaker intermolecular forces. Now I'm going to start out here with my weakest intermolecular force. Now this one here, it depends on whether or not you are German or English. This is, this is just one of these weird quirks of history. If you're English, this one is called London Dispersion Force. London Dispersion Force. Now if you are German, this is not called Berlin dispersion force. This is called van der Waal forces. Van der, van der Waal forces is the same thing here as London dispersion forces, but way back in the day, the English and the Germans weren't getting along with each other, so they both came up with their own name. Now, you might see these names used interchangeably, and, and so you're like, what, what, what is what? It's the same thing. Okay, so London dispersion forces. What is a London dispersion force? A London dispersion force is when you have an atom or a molecule where the electrons randomly are moved to one side or the other, making it polar. So this is a very weak force. Very, very weak force. Doesn't have a whole lot of attraction there. So not very sticky. London dispersion force, if those electrons are dispersed over to one side, then not very sticky. All right. Now, stronger than that, we have ion dipole. Ion dipole. Now, ion dipole, this is the attraction between an ion, such as like sodium, and something that's polar, like say water. And I'm going to show you a picture here. This is from your textbook. It looks like this here. All right, here's an ion dipole interaction. And what happens is, is if we take an ion and we stick it into water, like sodium chloride, for example, sodium is positively charged, and so the negative part of the oxygen, or excuse me, the water molecule will be attracted to that. And then the chlorine atom is electronegative, or is negatively charged, and so the part of the water molecule that's attracted to that would be the positive, electropositive hydrogens. And so we end up with the water molecules coming around these ions, forming these spheres of hydration. That's just a fancy word that says we have like a ball of molecules around it that are water molecules that are helping it to go into solution. Sphere of hydration. That's why water, they say, is a universal solvent. It can dissolve positive things. It can dissolve negative things. Positive and negative. Universal solvent. So that's another intermolecular force. Another one is dipole-dipole. So a dipole-dipole, this is between two polar molecules. So I'm going to say between two polar molecules. Between two polar molecules. So um, if we imagine two polar molecules, um, they have positive sides, they have negative sides. Those positives and negatives are attracted to each other, and they become sticky. They become sticky. And then lastly, the strongest intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonds. Okay, now there's a tricky thing about hydrogen bonds. And I'm going to make a little bit of space here and try to draw this for you. Because you would imagine, you would think that hydrogen bonds have hydrogen in them. Because it's got the name hydrogen in it, right? So it should have hydrogen. But not all things that have hydrogen make hydrogen bonds. Okay, 
let that dry there for just a moment. Hydrogen bonds. So in order for something to make a hydrogen bond, you have to have hydrogen. Okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, so you've got hydrogen. But that hydrogen has to be attached to a very electronegative element, and there's only three of them that count. And so it could be attached to an oxygen, or a fluorine, or a nitrogen. Okay, these are very electronegative. And so if these are electronegative, they pull electrons towards themselves, and then that hydrogen becomes electropositive for hydrogen bonds. So all of these will form hydrogen bonds. Now, if I were to draw, like, say, a water molecule like this, like this, okay, like that, this attraction here is the hydrogen bond. That's the hydrogen bond right there, okay? This bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, that is not the hydrogen bond. This is an intermolecular force. That is to say it has to be between two different molecules. So this will form a hydrogen bond, fluorine hydrogen, nitrogen hydrogen, they'll all form hydrogen bonds. What will not? Carbon hydrogen. Carbon is not a strongly electronegative element. So it will not form hydrogen bonds with water. Okay, so just because something has hydrogen does not mean it will make a hydrogen bond. Now, here's two water molecules. Notice the attraction between this hydrogen and that oxygen. Is this a hydrogen bond? Yes, yes, water makes hydrogen bonds. And we can say that because this hydrogen is attached to an oxygen atom, which is very electronegative, one of these very electronegative elements. Okay. All right, I think I think that's it. Okay, so I'm going to want to stop. Oh, yes, question. So this here, it has to be between between the hydrogen and some other electronegative element on a different molecule. But this right here could be a fluorine. It could also be a nitrogen. And this will still be a hydrogen bond. Shoot, no, mm. There's always, ah. ah. The other question I, I get sometimes, people will say, hey, is glass a solid or a liquid? I've heard people argue that glass is one of these things that it's, it's, um, it's kind of a solid, but it, over time it oozes. And they're like, what? What do you mean? And, and they said, well, if you ever look at glass in old houses, the thicker part of the pane of glass is at the bottom, and the thinner part is at the top. And so is that evidence then that over time it like settles out, like, like it, it warps or something like that? And so we were having windows replaced in the house. I live in an old house. And I asked the guy, hey, I heard this, this, this thing, and you know, what, like glass over time um, kind of changes its shape. Is that true? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, because the panes of glass are thicker at the bottom than at the top. And he's like, no. Well, is it true that the panes, well, he said, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing. He said, in, in the olden days, when your house was made 100 years ago, they didn't make glass as well as they do today. And so the glass came in different thicknesses and such. And if you have a bunch of these panes of glass, little triangles like this, and you stick them all together, if you have them not oriented the same way and you look out the glass, then everything is kitty wampus. It does, it's all out of whack. So what the glass people would do is they would on purpose put the thick side of the glass at the bottom so that way when you look out the glass, it made sense. It wasn't like looking like a like a bumblebee sees everything in all these different panes, right? So I was like, oh, so that's just an urban legend, right? He's like, yeah, it's not true. I was like, okay, I knew that. Yeah, I totally knew that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. All right, so glass, according to that guy, is not really a very viscous liquid.